Thank you very much, Lucia, um, for your very good presentation. That concludes this uh, set of three lectures. Um, as you know, we are now uh, entering the period of debate. We have uh, some time. Um, there is a, a place for question and answers where every attendant can uh, uh, put the questions. I see that there are already two questions um, addressed to Ian, but uh, uh, you have seen also that the panel now is enriched by uh, more people, other faces. They come from the project roadmap. <clears throat> they are uh, people in charge of different activities and they can also uh, take part in the discussion. So the three speakers, the three panelists, also you can ask questions to each other if you wish. And all I ask you, if you want to speak, is to uh, raise your hand so that uh, uh, I can give you the, the, the floor. Uh, but as we have now at least two questions addressed to Ian, I'd like to invite Ian if you want to read the questions that you have there and uh, address if possible. Thank you. You are muted. supposed to be a communicator and I can't even press a button. Okay, so uh, yeah, so the first one is from Umberto. Hi, Umberto, a long time no see. Um, he's talking about trust uh, and um, and maybe what we should be doing is developing that notion. I think that is a, I mean, I think all the speakers would probably agree, trust is the gold dust of communication. If you're trusted, then, and perhaps, uh, you know, we see the negative side of that. If you're trusted too much, then you could be, we're seeing it with all of the kind of misinformation as well, which which, uh, which hasn't been mentioned. But but trust is the thing that is really critical in all of this. The, the, the trouble is that I what I see in science communication workshops with scientists is that if they turn up and they say, how can we be trusted? And it's a very instrumentalized view. It's like, tell me the one, two, three in being trustworthy. And, and what they don't like to hear is that trust is a long-term process of immersing yourself in your audience and so that you become trusted. Uh, and it's not something you can just switch on and switch off. You can lose it very easily. So you can, it can switch off very easily, but it can't be turned on very easily. So I think probably trust, and this is something that I think that can only get done in those pre-event times of quiescence, whereby we should be in investing in scientists working and embedding themselves in communities so that they are the trusted go-to people afterwards. And that's a, that's a long process. It takes money and it takes resources. It's not very sexy. So that, that's a bit of a, a kind of problem there. Um, I'll just quickly talk about others because I don't want to hold them. Uh, Stefan talks about Gabe and co-create and says it might be challenged because the scientist is entering this other territory. How do you see that? Uh, yes. <laughs> that is the problem. So there's almost an ethical decision at the start when you decide you're going to communicate of what kind of communicator you want to be. Because I think there is this business that uh, scientists have thus far stepped back, presented technical reports and written papers and said, that's it, I've done my job, my stuff's out there. As soon as you then step forward into the public sphere, domain, it's messy and you're going to get involved with communities and politics and things like that. So the only advice I've got is that you should understand those environments as best you can through the, exactly the mechanisms of saying about trust so that you can make a judgment on what your role is, is there. But it is very difficult. And I think it should be the subject of deep ethical self-reflection amongst projects like this, whereby you're actually asking the researchers what their role is and how far they've done it. I've done this in uh, workshops where there's complete uh, disagreement across the board about people, about the extent to which they should be involved in themselves in this. And that's a, it's a personal uh, decision. Um, and I don't know if, uh, the, the, there's a third one, Domenico, do you want me to answer that? It's quite a long one, I haven't read it yet. Or shall I, maybe, maybe better at this point to invite some of the others in to, to those issues as well. I'm sure they've got things to say and then I can go back to Cecilia's one. Okay, and while you think about the last um, last question that you have, let me ask Nicola um, 
on the case that you presented of the COVID-19 situation. Um, may I ask you, are we learning, let's say, as a, as a community, as a, as a world, on this risk communication from this example of COVID? Do you think uh, what, is, what has improved? Are we better now in the, this process of risk communication? Well, I'm afraid the picture is a bit mixed. Um, so first of all, as, as I, as I uh, mentioned in the beginning, the, the nature of the crisis has changed a lot during these two months, this, during these two years. So we've gone to a first phase where, um, where, where, where the situation was really pretty much the one of a crisis. So in, in that sense, more, more similar to the, um, to the punctual crisis, like you could have you know, in an earthquake, uh, in, a, in, a, in a major um, uh, proper disaster. And, uh, and then at some point uh, during 2021, we moved to this chronic phase where you know, we, we uh, we, 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 we tend to think that we are over the cliff, that the worst is, uh, is behind our back. And, um, and sometimes we, 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 we feel like we are back at square one. Um, my point is, uh, I am afraid that at this point, the nature of the problems of these communications have changed quite significantly from the first half of 2020. And, uh, I have a feeling that we have learned lessons that we may be able to apply in a new crisis of the kind of crisis we have in the early part of 2020, be it a new pandemic that we know, we, we know because epidemiologists tell us that it will happen again sometime, maybe in our own lifetime, maybe in our children's lifetime, but it will happen again, or in other uh, crises and disasters of a different nature. But we are now in a new territory with this kind of chronic, long-term, periodical uh, reworsening of the crisis. And to be honest, by looking around at, at most national examples, uh, I have a feeling that we have a lot to learn again on how to manage this specific phase that we are on. So maybe that's not too much a reassuring question, but... Uh, yeah, I think we have learned a lot of a, a lot of useful stuff, and were we able to? Well, we, I mean, professional risk communicators, uh, policymakers, even journalists, maybe who are sometimes slow to learn, but um, even journalists, were we able to go back to the spring of 2020? Yes, we will know how to do a lot of things better. Uh, but we are now facing entirely new problem, and unfortunately, we have to learn again, and we are learning again. I'm afraid. Um, yeah, Th there was a small comment I wanted to make since I'm speaking, since I'm the one speaking on um, uh, Jan's uh, presentation. I, I, I loved uh, both uh, Lucia's and uh, Jan's presentations. I, I thought they were great uh, and I learned a lot from them. Uh, I was interested in the point that he was making on how uh, a, um, a participatory communication, one that aims to involve uh, uh, the audience uh, is uh, um, fundamentally different from some kind of, uh, you know, typically journalistic communication, let's say the classic journalistic communication where you're delivering a message, uh, uh, the, the classic, let's say, um, out, uh, science outreach, science, uh, science uh, journalism model. And that is totally true if you take a, a, a historical perspective, but let's say to add to the validity of that point, I have to say that also if you look into the media industry today, into actually actual media outlets, most of them and the most successful ones are actually moving towards the same model because it's the only way to survive. And that includes using social media data like, uh, like Lucia showed, to know your audience well, to understand what they want, what are their desires, their needs, their personality traits, their values, which is extremely uh, important. Uh, and actually finding ways to, you know, to, to make that exchange that used to be a top-down unidirectional exchange 
a bidirectional one. So th that's really, you know, like a, a, a forced choice at this point for everyone, surely for professionals of risk communication, but actually also the journalistic uh, uh, professional know-how is very much going into that direction. Can I respond to that? Because I agree, I agree completely. Uh, um, and I think that um, if you're a journalist, actually, journalists and media people are across all three of those simultaneously. My point, I guess, was I was coming at it from the motivation of the expert driven. And in the expert one, they use make and sell as a passive one way conduit. So they're not actually, so most journalists are, are interested in the work that they do, but they want to engage, they want to entertain, and then they feel it's a two-way process and they have connections. And social media has created, as you say, these, particularly with Twitter and things like these communities themselves. But actually, I think what still happens is the experts is it's an instrumentalized channel. So it wants to learn the tricks and devices of the, of yourself in order to just send that information out. And it's very different from, from the way that a journalist or a writer would approach that. So I think if you're in the media world, absolutely. But I think if you're out of it in our kind of technical world, we still are very transactional about these processes. So I think that I didn't make that clear, I apologize. Thank you very much, Shane. Uh, I'd like now to address Lucia. Uh, you brought this very interesting topic of uh, listening to people. Um, but my question is, during the crisis, how can we speak with the people? Uh, my background, I'm a scientist, and for, uh, my expertise is forest fires. And I've seen that quite often, let's say, during a fire, it's very difficult to address the communication and the, the uh, people. And very often, the media uh, take this hole. And um, regarding to this, I'd like also to ask you, when you speak about Facebook and these new social media, sometimes um, I have the feeling that they create new uh, noise and they can even create more communication that might, let's say, complicate the process. Do you want to comment on this, please? Uh, yes, absolutely. And uh, well, to your first question, um, so uh, during a fire, it would be really hard to reach uh, people like exactly when it happens, because they will be worried about saving themselves rather than checking Twitter or Facebook or I don't know, a press release or uh, whatever like communication outlet you're choosing. So that's uh, that's why I emphasize the point of preemptive measures and in, in kind of like a lot of these things happen in the background. So ideally, uh, before that fire happens, like um, so the messaging would have been like this is this this is what could happen. Um, these are the routes that you can follow. Uh, in case something happens. And these are the contact informations that you can reach if you need help. So, um, so that, would be, that would be on that side. Um, of course, in the part of um, social media listening and kind of like, that's, uh, um, that is a problem of social media data that is, uh, that uh, I describe it as like social media is like this ever living space that houses so many conversations. And then you as a listener, you have to be very clever in a way or like very knowledgeable into nudging ex the information that you need, exact the exact information that you need. But for these, you need tools and you need that knowledge uh, of how to search information. So it's a different set of, um, of capabilities uh, that you need from, from those of the regular communicator. Um, so having said that, once, once you find out how to search for information in a specific platform, then it's easier to have your insights. But then we have the problem that now communities tend to go into more intimate um, um, uh, social media platforms uh, or social media uh, messaging apps. So in that, in that sense, the, um, the strategy turns into 
being able to have a direct conversation or kind of like getting into those uh, intimate groups, for example, that are that are formed, uh, those community groups, and kind of like establish a conversation. So, um, so as you see, the kind of like the strategy goes from like a one directional thing where we just talk and talk and talk into kind of like well, seeing where the people are and and narrowing down their conversation into being a part of the conversation in a part of their environment. Thank you, uh, Lucia. May I now invite Ian to, if you want to address the third comment or question that was made to you. And Nicola, you have also a question in, your, in the box, please. Thanks, uh, Domingo. Yeah, there's a, the question from Cecilia who, who talks about the financial uh, aspects of this, and particularly in relation to preparedness and, and retrofitting for seismic risk, and makes the point, you know, that if resources weren't limited, I guess uh, most people would be eager to retrofit their homes. Well, actually, I think the literature on this, the academic literature suggests that that's a very minor point, that people often, even if they have the money, don't retrofit their homes. There's a, and and Nic, Nicola talked about this, some of the heuristics, the shortcuts that people make. It turns out that you know, people often, for example, acknowledge there's a risk, but acknowledge but feel the risk is much higher for other people than for themselves. They're okay. It's the other people that need to take care. Um, and actually, you find a nice example from social scientists looking after, even after the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, that, well, that what happened was people that in the area that the earthquake happened so where they, essentially the hazard had happened and the risk was lowered, they were increased the likelihood to have retrofitting. But the people in the neighboring areas um, actually didn't have any uptake. And there was no correlation between actual geophysical risks of distance to, to um, a fault line and therefore need to retrofit and the propensity for people to take up the uh, retrofitting that people did it because of the nature of who they were. Um, so I think as long as we are missing that, then all of the things that follow, all of our information and factual stuff about financial assistance and then policy and how we approach people are going to come to nothing because we have to understand the, I think we would see it as the irrationality of the public, but actually it's a, just an alternative rationality. It's a rationality of the person, and Lucia mentioned that, in the context that they are, they're actually probably making very rational decisions to reflect their, their circumstances. They're just not the, the um, circumstances or the, the decisions that we expect. So I think there's a lot that we need to learn and glean from, from those social sciences and communication science. And again, I'd be very, you know, be great to hear from Nicola and Lucia about, about how they feel about that kind of aspect. Um, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I will first address the question in the chat, maybe um, in the Q&A tool. So the question is, I described the French map as a good example, uh, but that map went against the official risk map produced by the ECDC uh, that was to be, supposed to be the standard to be adopted. Don't you fear that a total different representation of risk created even more confusion, says Jorge Gomez. I totally agree, actually. I mean, I was commenting in the slide about the effectiveness of the tool itself, uh, of the, let's, let's say, visual language uh, and communication tool itself. That said, and that also goes back to the, to the previous question about the lessons that we have learned and the others that we still haven't learned yet. Uh, it is my personal opinion that uh, lack of coordination and consistency that we often saw during that crisis that we're still seeing on many points between uh, national and international super, supranational institutions, such as member states and the European Union in this case, uh, between uh, states and their lower administrative level, the regions in Italy, etc. Um, that has been often a problem that has really, hasn't really helped the population. That may be true of the case you are mentioning. Uh, that was certainly true in various instances with the conflict between uh, conflict. Uh, conflict, maybe it's, it's a, not always the right word, but inconsistency between the European Medicine Agency and uh, the individual uh, uh, drug regulators. 
um, with the travel restrictions that were often not uh, uh, negotiated, not coordinated, and created a lot of confusion and was notoriously different, difficult for all of us to navigate. So uh, yeah, in that sense, I agree with you with your comment. Of course, it, it, in an ideal world, we would have the CDC map uh, applied by all member states without inconsistencies. Nicola, do you want to address the question from Ian? Oh, the, the, can you remind me the, the question? Sorry, I, I spoke too much about this one. I can't remember either now. <laughs> I think it was about it was about that way that people process information being what experts often think of as being irrational, and actually it's just a different type of rational behavior, I guess. Yeah. Well, th there is a point I, I would. I, I think it. I wanted to make about about this this topic on the on the. Uh, uh, in my presentation, and maybe it's useful to bring it up here again because in the end I was rushing a bit and didn't mention it. But on the on the line of what is rational and what is rational, th those are always dangerous dangerous uh, concepts because they they're a bit uh, oversimplifying. And um, uh, well, so I think first of all, you you have always a key role of trust. I think that the, 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 the first word is always uh, trust. So w once uh, a channel of trust is established between institutions and the public, between the professional communicators and the public, uh, um, you, let's say, you decrease a lot of pro the probability that, that uh, messages will be taken in a totally uh, irrational way, et cetera. So, I would focus always first on trust, on organizing communication. And another example of this rational, irrational divide that is, uh, um, that is maybe sometimes underestimated is, um, I had one slide in my presentation that taken from, uh, let's say, risk communications, good practices uh, in, in, in the literature that said basically panic is a false problem. A lot of uh, very often um, debatable uh, risk communications choices by institutions uh, such as not presenting totally the complexity of a risk uh, and not being totally transparent ab about the dimension of the risk and the actual level of a risk or about the uncertainty in the scientific uh, understanding of the risk. Uh, it happens very often that, that people uh, choose not to be entirely transparent on such topics uh, on the ground that uh, if we say everything, uh, people may panic. And actually, a lot of studies uh, tell you that that is really a false problem. People don't panic. Panic is a very rare phenomenon. I mean, if, if we saw a meteor hinting at us now out of my window, we, we, I would panic. But uh, in general, people, even in the face of, of, of dangers, uh, uh, do not panic. They, they, they worry, but they still, uh, you know, they're still in a position where they can take uh, uh, informed decisions. And um, um, so in, in that sense, I think I would, um, on one side, credit people to be a, a bit more rational than they're often uh, supposed to be. And, and on the other, to always remember that when the, the, the relation is established from a position of trust, uh, then, uh, uh, then this problem can be more easily overcome. Thank you very much, Nicola. I'd like now to invite Daniela De Bucci. She raised your hand, please, Daniela. Daniel, your macro is not working again. Daniela, is there any problem with your macro? <laughs> okay, I understand that you are going to type something. In the meantime, if you allow, uh, we will move to Lucia that has also raised her hand, so you can type without any pressure. 
please lucia yeah well i uh, i was uh there was a point that uh ian made about the people are making decisions it's just not the decisions that we expect and that made me think about immigrant co uh, communities and kind of like pockets of communities that can be found in other localities that for them they in any types also with the, what nicola was saying about rational decisions like for them for example during covid it was very rational for some of these communities to come together and stay together as a family and just like be agglomerated like 10 people in one spot whereas like our other like rational mind was like no just like be be separated so that's uh that's interesting to see how different sectors of the communities or like how different types of communities react to um to whatever to the situation at hand and the situation that is happening so like here the 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 most fresh example that we have is COVID-19 and how people reacted to the different stages about that. And it is different, and it was very different how the general population, uh, for example, here in Norway, the, as I observed it, like the general population was uh, acting as opposed to these immigrant uh, pockets of population. So that I, the, um, I think that's well connected with that point that Eon was making and it kind of connects to again the point to kind of like knowing those populations beforehand and try and trying to address them in a way. So for example, I remember someone asked like, well, where is the information in other languages? Um, and, and some officers said like, well, it is translated in our website, but in order to get to a website, you have to know the local language. So how are you ever going to reach that? Um, so yeah, that's just my reflection on that point. Thank you very much, Lucia. I don't know, Daniela, are you ready to speak now? <laughs> or did you write any message, I suppose? Okay. Well, I don't get to your message, but in the meantime, there is a message in the question and the answers from Ilaria Salvi. Uh, I think this is addressed to all three speakers. So if you want to read it and uh, uh, address it. But Daniela, where is your... Daniela's questions in the um, chat, just noticed. I can read it out if it's useful. Uh, she, she mentions two-way interaction is relatively easier at local scale, much more complex at national scale. Any suggestions on how to practically address this challenge, for instance, in the case of a national civil protection? Um, if, I, if I have a go at that and then I pass it on, yes, absolutely, it's very difficult. And the reason it's very difficult is any media person will tell you is, the more specific you can be about your audience, the more easier you can be about how you reach them. If you if you really understand them, you know what they're worried about, you know their concerns, and you can apply your expertise to that. Um, so trying to scale that up to a national level um, is always uh, troublesome, and there'll always be areas that is difficult. I, I think that um, I'm sure the other two have got, more useful things to say about this. What I, what I would say is that I think a lot of experts say to me, I don't, I don't know what to communicate. I don't know how to communicate. How do I do it? And it's because usually they haven't really thought about who they're trying to reach. And I think that having a better understanding of the audience they're trying to reach will help the individual communications strategy of, of that. Um, but in terms of how you do it um, at scale, um, the, the one thing that I would say is something I've been involved in recently is the clim uh, climate assemblies, citizens' assemblies, where um, individuals, uh, normal people work through really quite complicated problems and actually show a real um, deep um, ability to connect and understand those problems and make rational decisions. So it kind of goes back to what Nicola says. I think when we give people the opportunity, they actually show that they really understand what we're trying to get at, including things like uncertainty and all the rest of it. Um, but it provides a different grammar, a different language to the interaction. But maybe I'd be interested to hear what others think on that. Yeah, from, from my side on this question, I, I, I totally acknowledge the difficulty. I, the only way I see, and, and the, it, it is not an, necessarily an answer that makes it easier, because of course it has organizational uh, uh, logistical uh, difficulties into it, but uh, uh, 
the only way I see is to, you know, make the, the national scale a, a collection of smaller scales uh, uh, points uh, where you are able to interact uh, with the communities uh, and to uh, establish uh, established exchanges with uh, uh, with local communities. Also, I have to say, at least in the in the COVID example where that the, about which I've focused today, but I think you can make the same the case for many other kinds of crises. I think we have learned uh, that the local level is very important. I mean, it's a the, the more you scale up to the national level, not to mention the continental level, the more information you lose uh, and the more uh, you lose the track of how different communities with different values, with different socioeconomic uh, uh, situations uh, uh, can uh, react significantly different to the crisis. Uh, so a very different information to provide to you. So I think in an ideal world, uh, any national institution that has to deal with uh, should be able to should find ways to delegate to local chapters that are somehow able to uh, interact with local communities and then compose a picture that you know that does not necessarily abstract from the very strong specificities that you can have at the local level in terms of response to the crisis. And it's terribly difficult. I mean, I have no, uh, because it's, it's an organizational problem. It, it, it has many angles to it, but uh, let's pretending for a moment uh, that there is an, uh, that, that, that uh, it's easier to do it than, than what it actually is. I think that would be the way forward. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, Lucia, do you want to comment about this? Point. Yes, so uh, it, it is more or less on the same lines uh, about um, tapping into the local abilities or like the local closeness to uh, potentially affected people. It's uh, it's it, it, that that is probably the way I, I would see this problem to go. So like from a civil um, protection perspective, they like, Kind of like tapping into collaboration strategies with the local agencies. I don't know. I don't know exactly how how your organization is is set up, but I'm imagining that's a national civil protection. There are like little civil protection uh, localities in different parts, and and then kind of like having a conversation. But beyond that, maybe tapping into simulations or exercises and kind of imagining like what if. Uh, uh, one of the risks that we are afraid to becomes a reality. How would we address people? How can we, like, and now I'm, uh, I'm saying we, but like, how can the national civil protection support better the local um, communications into addressing these people? So I, I feel like, like that's one side. And then the other side is kind of like the two-way interaction is probably um, being available as, a, as an organization and being open to having a conversation with, uh, with different pockets of the population. That's my two cents. Thank you, Lucia. Uh, Mauro, please. <clears throat> thanks, Xavier. Uh, and uh, thanks to all the speakers because they made very, very um, appreciable uh, presentations on uh, the same topic, but with different point of, points of view. So thanks, Nicola, Yain, and uh, Lucia. Uh, I have uh, some questions, but I will uh, just put one uh, about the contradictions that uh, there are within the scientific community of course different points of view have uh, uh, always existed in the within the scientific community and uh, uh, in the past uh, uh, they were uh, restricted in the site within the scientific community uh, and, but with the uh, increase of the uh, media communication, especially social media in the uh, last decades, uh, the problem is that uh, scientists uh, uh, try to, to, to find the shortcuts. And uh, this, is, this can be very dangerous, uh, as you see, not because uh, there are contradictions, but because uh, they cannot be understood by the large public. So I would like to ask you if you 
see any possibility of improving the situation on uh, this aspect uh, because uh, very often uh, information that should be uh, addressed to scientific magazines are instead uh, addressed in, to, in, uh, into social media or uh, communication media. Thank you. Well, maybe I start, and um, okay. then I, I think it's a topic on, on which we uh, have all opinions. But um, so, in terms of the contradictions and let's say the the the, uh, the crowded the nature of of uh, scientific opinions uh, that that we have seen, especially in some countries. I mean, uh, I mentioned the example of Italy because. Uh, it wasn't the only one, but it was particularly significant. Well, first of all, uh, I mean, th this has been a topic of debate uh, in the uh, in the scientific community, in the journalistic community, etc. So sometimes when people suggest that you know uh, scientists should uh, um, talk less to the media, that these contradictions and difference of opinions should be less uh, uh, visible to the public. Uh, uh, then the person suggesting this idea is very easily accused of wanting to censor, uh, you know, to, to use censorship towards opinion, etc. So, uh, first of all, I think we must, uh, I, well, this is totally a personal opinion, but I think we, we should uh, draw a clear line between uh, scientists who are speaking in their own capacity, representing themselves as experts, and scientists who, in that specific moment, have uh, a, an official role, uh, either as members of official committees, uh, of uh, as official advisors to the policymakers, etc. So, uh, at least in this second case, uh, I really believe uh, that uh, more coordination of messages and limiting the number of people who speak uh, on behalf. Uh, of the decisions makers on behalf of the government or whatever is a good, is a better choice. Uh, so in, in that case, for example, in Italy, uh, I think there was a little bit uh, too much, uh, too many subjects that had an institutional role and that in addition to the institutional role, were speaking regularly to the public. So in my opinion, that was a communicate on mistake. That has nothing to do with censorship. But, um, then on the other hand are the scientists who uh, give interviews. And that also has a lot, I mean, you can't discuss that without discussing the responsibility of the media system itself. Because uh, uh, in that case, uh, that depends a lot on uh, how the media, and again, there are very specific national differences, I believe, uh, the way the media use experts uh, and uh, uh, how much they rely on having different voices to give variety, diversity to their coverage with possible negative results. Again, I go back to the difference between Italy and Switzerland because they happen to be two countries I, I know very well because I come from one and I currently live in the other one. Um, so in this respect, during uh, the first phase of the pandemic, the two countries were extremely different because in terms of official communication, the difference was striking. I mean, Switzerland was literally speaking with two people, while in Italy we had a bit more. I have to say there was really a lot of difference on the media side as well, because uh, despite Switzerland not lacking uh, top universities, top institutions, and scientists who probably had interesting things to say, the media tended to not interviewing uh, three different people every day. And that, that, that's just a choice that depends on how the, you know, the, the, the local uh, um, professional habits of the, of the journalist works. Uh, but this is just to say that, I, I mean, personally, I will never invoke uh, limitations to the right of experts to, to speak uh, to, the, to the media whenever they, they like. But there, there should be a clear line perceivable by the audience on who speaks for themselves uh, and who speaks uh, uh, for the authorities in an official role. 
if, if I can, but I can add to that. I think it's a real problem, and I think it's a problem that's got worse. Funnily enough, as scientists have been encouraged to to communicate to the, to the public by their universities, by their institutions, and by their press teams who push them out there. I think, though, it's a problem that's really particularly acute in the crisis. I mean, Lucia mentioned that, do that risk in crisis one. But in the crisis moment, that's when it's really critical. I think in the earlier phase, when it's a bit quiet, I think the public are quite tolerant of scientists and experts disagreeing with each other. But they're less tolerant of it in crisis mode. And, you know, it strikes me right now there's a volcano erupting in Java. The Twitter social media feed is full of volcanologists talking about this eruption. Now, it's interesting because they've got their own Twitter kind of community and they're talking amongst themselves. But of course, amongst that are lots of people in the public and lots of journalists. And so what it's doing is it's creating this kind of noise. And it's interesting that community, I think more than some of the other disaster risk communities, have recognized that. And actually, what you'll find is quite a lot of the feeds, the volcanologists are saying, listen to what the Indonesian, Indonesian authorities are saying. This is what you need to do. And they're, they're, out, they're reinforcing the risk the actionable risk messages on the ground. But equally, there'll be a whole bunch not who'll be saying, this isn't the big one, the big one's not as big as this, or talking about the dangers of pyroclastic flows, which is absolutely terrifying if you're on the ground. So I think we have to have a moral and ethical responsibility as a group of scientists about when and where we get involved and when we stay out. And I, I would argue um, very much that in emergency management, we should stay out. Thank you very much, Cheyenne. Lucia, I don't know if you want also to address this question. Well, uh, I'd like, like uh, both uh, Nicola and Ian said, uh, this is a very complex question and a complex issue to solve. Uh, not only because, of course, like in the scientist community, we want to like make our voice and kind of like show how much we know and uh, how we contribute to uh, the society. And then on the other side, there is uh, media trying to report things, report facts, but also kind of trying to construct uh, a story. And when these two merge, they, this it is incredibly complicated to discern what is real. And then they just like the decision, uh, the making decisions point that we talked about, there are different realities or di different truths in, in a way uh, or different ways to tackle a problem. So um, I completely agree with Ian. And I, I think that it, it, it is a responsibility as scientists or like as uh, communicators to give the word to those uh, who are the experts in this case. So in the case of the volcano to the emergency management authorities in Indonesia, the, those are the people who actually know what's going on on site. And those are the people who know actually what uh, measurements need to be taken to be to carry on uh, the people safely into, um, yeah, into safe and secure uh, places. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to all. I think now it's time to close. We are uh, at, uh, reaching at the end of our time. And before giving the floor to Andrea Prota, the coordinator of the project, to say the closing remarks, from my side, I would like to thank all of the speakers for the excellent um, conference that you, you gave and lots of the food for thought that you provided us. And I would like to ask also the attendees for their presence and their interest. I can count that around 180 people followed this webinar from the beginning, with, which I think is quite good given the number of um, initiatives that you have nowadays. I would like to thank uh, to all the members of the consortium roadmap and in particular to the colleagues of my team who supported me in preparing this, um, this meeting. Uh, we see that we have received lots of comments, many positive ones, and we thank also the, the audience members for that. And uh, this encourages us to go on with these sort of initiatives. Uh, from my side, that's all. Uh, I'm sure that I'll not meet you before Christmas, so I wish you all a good Christmas from my side. Please, Andrea. <clears throat> Thanks, Domingos. Uh, I confirm that uh, by reading the the chat, um, I'm very delighted that uh, all the uh, attendees uh, are showing appreciation for the topic we selected for the 
contents of the presentation and the, of the discussion. So um, really great thanks to our speakers, Lucia, Jan, and Gola. I use the, the first names to thank them, and as well as to the partners of the project. Um, and uh, again, a special thanks to the, the team of uh, ADAI, led by Professor Domingo Schwiegas, who organized and managed this, this uh, webinar. Um, I think the presentation and discussion uh, will feed uh, and will guide uh, further our uh, thought about uh, the definition of the solution explorer of the contents of the further activities that roadmap project uh, will do in the next month. So um, I thank you again and I invite you to follow the developments of this project on the website and also from my side uh, I wish you a uh, Merry Christmas and uh, all the best for the new year and uh, we'll, uh, we'll keep going uh, for sure. The results of this uh, webinar will be very useful and uh, of benefit to the project. So thanks again uh, and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you.